Well, one of the places where I think people in our in my line of work have fallen down is the assault on voting rights. Historically, it's been predicated on all sorts of, of, of ugly things. In the last four years, it's been predicated on a lie, something Bill Barr calls bullshit, just to quote Bill Barr. How do you assess the progress they made in voter suppression legislation enacted at the state le at state level, even uh, by Republicans who push back. I mean, in, in Georgia, um, a voter suppression law so odious to Major League Baseball that they moved the All Star Game to another state, and and now people sort of just shrug, and it's 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 what had to be, even though even though the Georgia Republican official, Secretary of State and Governor, said there was no fraud there. How do we one do a better job, and two stop that erosion of of voting rights? Yeah, I mean, that one, that's a genie that in some ways is out of the bottle and is going to be hard to get back, at least that first part. You know, there is this feeling, uh, it is totally unfounded that there is widespread um, voter fraud. Forget about even the 2020 election and whether or not that was stolen. There is this fear that somehow, some way, substantial numbers of people who shouldn't have the ability to vote are in fact voting, that voting is count, miscounted uh, in, in a way that favors one party or, or the other. That's got to be pushed back again with statistical evidence, uh, with public officials who are willing to stand up and say that, in fact, is not true. You know, the Brennan Center has done great work in, in that regard. And again, these are things that are not necessarily as attractive as the lies are, but it means that there has to be discipline on the side of those people who are standing for democracy and then pushing it out there again and again and again and reassuring the American people that our system works well in the way in which um, it is presently constituted. Um, we, at the, ND, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee that, that I head up, you know, we got 5,000 poll workers for, um, recruited 5,000 poll workers for the 2000, for the 2020 election. And we're going to try to double that for the election in 2024, all in an attempt to get Republicans, Democrats, independents, conservatives, progressives uh, engaged in our, our civic system. And so, uh, you know, it's going to take examples like that, efforts like that, um, message discipline in, in the way that I have described. It's going to be hard, but I, I think it can ultimately um, be done. And again, that fear notion. If you don't vote, mm -hmm. if you don't trust in the system, um, you are leading this nation down an authoritarian path from which we might never recover. That has to be a component of, uh, of the message. What do you make of the sort of silence uh, among the business community? Um, we've been trying to cover this this question of autocracy in America, the idea that it could happen here. Six months ago, it seems sort of far-fetched. Now everyone is, it seems, kind of keyed into the, the possibility. I mean, people like yourself who, who watch it closely at a policy level and, and know all of the metrics and, and what's ticking up, um, un understood it at an intuitive level. But but even amid the public who, who are consuming news, understand it is a very real threat, and it's what Trump's running on. But, but what do you make of the silence in the business community, their indifference to America turning into something um, that more closely resembles Orban's hungry? Yeah, it's interesting because I think the business community, I, I see in, in two ways. One, there are those who think that the election of Trump is going to do something positive for them um, financially, either personally, financially, or their, um, their, their companies are going to benefit from uh, you know, a, a Trump presidency. All right, that's that's one. There's another part of the business community, and I think it's probably the majority, um, who don't want to get involved in political things at all, and they stay silent. Um, they don't understand necessarily the power that they have and that I think should be used in defense of democracy, and also don't understand that, you know, if you give Trump this power, he then has the ability to pick winners and losers in the economic mm -hmm. sphere. And he'll decide, or his Justice Department will decide, you know, who gets prosecuted for what kinds of crimes, what mergers go through, what mergers are opposed by the antitrust division. Um, you know, the rule of law and the neutrality of the Justice Department is something that ought to matter to the um, to the business community. Again, there are going to be those who are going to make a, a real bargain with the devil, with the hope that, or with the thought that they're going to they're going to do better economically, and um, that's a that's a hell of a price to, a hell of a price to pay um, for our democracy. You know, to put your economic advantage uh, above that which has defined this nation um, at its best. It's just an amazing failure of imagination. I mean, we've now, we know Trump. We've watched him. Some CEO's daughter could tweet an unflattering picture of Trump. He could decide to sabotage a company's stock price. It just feels like on year nine 
Um, this is an important part of the country that shouldn't stay silent. I, I want to ask you about the Supreme Court, and I want to ask you how you're thinking about this period where we are waiting for the extraordinary, for, for something that people told us we wouldn't have to worry about. We're waiting for the Supreme Court's opinion on immunity. And Trump has actually argued before the Supreme Court, and based on the questioning, has some receptive audience members to the idea that a president should be immune from prosecution. What, how are you thinking about this period, and do you have any predictions? Well, I got to tell you this. I mean, anything less than a decision by the Supreme Court that says a, a president should be held to the laws just like any other American citizen should be, anything other than that is absurd. The notion, for instance, that apparently some justices are, are fooling around with it. Well, if the president violated the criminal law but was doing so in his official capacity, there may be some basis to say that that's okay. We need to step back and, and think about that. Um, you know, wait a minute. A president can violate the American criminal law if he or she is doing something in their official capacity. That is an absurd and dangerous um, conclusion. And I'm worried, given the length of time that it has taken for the Supreme Court to decide this case, that something along those lines might come out of the um, Supreme Court. You know, the, the, the federal appellate court gave that argument short shrift and wrote, I think, a very compelling opinion. It's hard for me to understand why the court even took this case. I'm worried when Justice Kavanaugh says things like, we have to write for the ages. No, you don't. You need to decide the case just in front of you on the basis of the facts and the law that has been presented to you. And if that, if you do that, you will reach the same conclusion as the appellate court, that a president needs to be held accountable in the same way that any other American um, would be. Any result other than that is, uh, is I think, both absurd um, and extremely, extremely dangerous.